just read probably my most disappointing five star prediction ever. So I need us to fix that, right that wrong, that injustice that was done to me. Also, I am in the middle of redoing all of my books. I am getting new bookshelves next week. I am going, like right now, all of my books are just stacked in uneven piles on the floor. So therefore, I cannot sit in front of my other bookshelf because I've taken all of the books off of that so I can reorganize everything. So we're going to sit in front of all my plans instead. And we are going into this vlog with good vibes only by reading some of my most highly anticipated five star predictions. And I am really, really hoping that these are all a success. Now, the book that prompted all of this actually came about when I was shopping at Barnes & Noble on my birthday a few days ago, and I came across this beauty right here. I didn't know that this existed. I love Olive E. Blake's writing. I think that The Atlas Paradox, which is the sequel to The Atlas Six, and Alone With You in the Ether are most likely, most definitely going to end up on my favorites list of the year. I just love her writing. I know it's pretentious. I know that there's like no plot and it's all just character and prose and fluff and I just eat that shit up. So when I saw this and I saw that it was a Barnes & Noble exclusive edition, which, excuse me, look at that, gorgeous. And then I went on Amazon and saw that this isn't even available until April. And right now it is mid-March. I was like, I absolutely need this and I need to read it right now. Unfortunately, I was reading a couple of other books from a different vlog, which is already up, where I read based on my zodiac sign, which also had my most disappointing read ever. So I need this to be good. I need this to fill up my soul. And since I have already given two of her books a five star and one a four star, although I believe that upon reread, the Atlas Six would be a five star. I am going into this with the utmost amount of excitement and hope and promise. Do I know what this is about? Absolutely not. I do think that this was probably indie, like self-published and now has being released traditionally because it says the copyright is from 2019, but Amazon says that the release is next month. So that would be my guess is that kind of like the Atlas Six, it's being re-released, but in traditional publishing. An intricate web of love, magic, and rival, <gasps> rival witch families in New York City. Come on, come on. Modern day Manhattan. Two rival witch families fight to maintain control of their respected criminal empires. That's all I need to know. That is literally it. Either way, I can't fucking wait. I am so excited about this. Let's do it. Oh, hi friends. I keep forgetting to do intros and it's been so many times that I've forgotten to do an intro. I've just gotten comfortable with not doing them. And then I started questioning, do we even need them? Because every single video that I click on on YouTube, if you're just saying hi, it's like, yeah, I'm here. There's my two cents for the day. <laughs> We're moving this because cannot be hindered. Now that I think I have my furniture where I want it, I need to redo the decorations that I have on the walls and like put something here and probably change this up because I'm getting bored with it. I am pretty sure that this is supposed to give us the vibes of a Romeo and Juliet retelling. And it's even kind of written like a play. Not, not fully, but let me show you. It has like the cast of characters at the beginning. And then it has act one. And then it's not split up into chapters, but it's split up into like act one, part two. She is just one of those authors that I understand why people don't love her because everything that I read from her feels like it takes a long time to read. And it is usually very heavily character based and not so much plot based. And most of the characters are pretentious and unlikable. And a lot of the writing could be seen as pretentious or too fluffy, but everything about it just comes together to work so perfectly for me. And that is saying a lot because I went into the Atlas Six, the only reason I read it was because of Katie's Patreon book club last year. And it was like one of the first, like after I joined our Patreon, it was like one of the first book clubs. And I had just gotten the book, like I'd find it for like $5. So I was like, well, I already have it, might as well pick it up. But I figured I had heard about it like a lot on TikTok. And a lot of times TikTok fantasy recommendations don't work for me. So I figured that I probably wasn't gonna like it very much. So I didn't even go into it with an open mind. So the fact that that book blew me away and then the Atlas Paradox blew me away even more. And then I loved her romance, which generally speaking, contemporary romance doesn't work for me. I love it. Also, if my hair is looking a little bit orange over the next few days, it's because it is. I, last night at 3 a.m., yes, 3 a.m., still couldn't fall asleep. So randomly I was like, mm, 
I want to go back blonde or just something that is not brown. Given the fact that I hate the haircut I got, I need something to make it a little bit more fun. So I did a round of color oops, which is like something that takes out the color of your hair and like reverts it because I was blonde before this. But then I, you have to like wash it out with really hot water for like at least a half hour. And I ran out of fucks to give. So I didn't rinse it out for that long. So I'm gonna have to probably do another round and then probably bleach it. I'm just trying to get as much of the pigment out of it as I can before I bleach it. I got this new Titan mattress and mm, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but before I take it back, I bought a topper to try to see if that helps because it's just, I think a little too firm for me, even though I bought the one that has like the extra padding to it. I don't know if it's enough. So I'm waiting, just ignore everything going on here. I am waiting for this to expand, which is unfortunate because I would really like to stay in half, but I'm hoping that this topper will help the situation. Also, my skindapsis was getting way too long. It was like coming down onto the counter and like trailing along the counter. So I'm trying to train it to start trailing on the walls and the ceilings in the cabinets. I don't know how it's gonna work with the lighting because this is the only light in the kitchen. Technically light comes from my bedroom on the other side and like a little bit of light from the living room over here, but not really. And there is a vent right there. <laughs> But thus far, this thing, like I have the humidifier right underneath it, so it gets tons of humidity. And even trailing, it just would not stop growing. So I'm hoping now that I have given it a little bit more support, it will start like, growing along here and up here. We'll see. My context clue number one for that this is in fact a Romeo and Juliet retelling should have been that every single new act begins with a Romeo and Juliet quote. Earlier I attempted to explain the plot of this book to you, but I'm realizing just how absolutely awful it was. So we're gonna retry again, okay? So we have, this is a Romeo and Juliet retelling. I was wondering if it was, pretty sure it is. And we have the matriarchs and the patriarchs. And they're two main families who are kind of like the magical items dealers in New York City. And this is like an urban fantasy where we have witches, but we also have non-magical people, like hum regular humans who don't know about the witches. But the witches live amongst the humans. So the matriarchs, the Antonibas, they are, they're one mom, seven daughters. The main daughters that we're following so far are the oldest, Maria and the youngest, Sasha. And for the patriarch family, those are the Fedorovs, and that is a uh, dad and then his three sons. And you can tell that the, like, the parents kind of set up this war-type hatred of the other ones, but that the uh, children seem to have not been obliging by that. And like now, they're still at war and at odds, but there have been, some, and there is, and there possibly might be in the future, some love entanglements going on between some of the siblings. And let me just tell you, Olive Blake, her writing is a little bit pretentious, and most of her characters are meant to be pretentious and unlikable, but she writes them in a way that, like, you still love them and still weirdly root for them. And, like, even the mom in here, who I would classify as, like, villain behavior, I still love learning about her and her parts because she's such a good villain. And the older sister, she's got a lot of shit, okay? And you definitely don't agree with a lot of, like, her takes on the world and the decisions that she's making. But then there's also some that you do. And she's just so good at writing nuanced characters. And there's already so many parts of her that we're learning about that I've been highlighting and I just love. And her stories are generally character-based with, like, a little bit of fantasy and a little bit of plot thrown in there. And that's my vibe. And that's pretty much what we've got going on here as well. I am of the opinion that when it comes to all of e. Blake's books, the less that you know going in, the better. Just knowing, like, the general premise and trying it out to see if the writing is for you. And I think that it's something that you can pretty quickly catch on to figure out if you're going to like it or not. I would say, like... It, Within the first 50 to 100 pages of The Atlas Six, which is the first book that I read from her, I knew that, like, I was really vibing with it. And I just think her writing is so distinct. So if you've liked An Olive Blake before, I do think that you'll like this from what I've seen. I'm only on page, like, 80. But so far, it's got that similar vibe. I think I'm going to do one more round of Color Oops, 
and then I'm out of bleach so I'm probably gonna have to run to Sally Beauty tomorrow and because of that I need to figure out an audiobook that I want to listen to for this vlog and I'm leaning toward White Smoke by Tiffany D. Jackson. I've loved Grown and The Weight of Blood. I was like what was the other Tiffany D. Jackson book that I read? Both of those were five stars so I feel like this one is gonna be five stars and I have the audiobook for it on script and YA horror I tend to really like on audiobook so I think that that might be the one that I end up picking up. I did another round of color oops last night took out a lot of the majority of like that base pigment I don't know where I'm gonna go from here but that's not a concern for today because today my mom and I are going to these like waterfalls in Arkansas it, I think it's called like triple falls or something there's like three of them and then apparently elk come at dusk we'll see if it's as magical as it sounds but I did yesterday end up starting White Smoke listening to the audiobook. I don't know if I'm loving the audiobook so far. So I would prefer, I think, to actually listen to Monday's Not Coming, but Scrib doesn't give me access to that for like another two days. So for now, I'm going to continue listening to White Smoke. It's not terrible. It's just not like my favorite audiobook experience thus far, but the book itself... Okay, so I thought maybe this was going to be like a sprinkle of Haunted House vibes. No, no. It is like right off the bat haunted house something weird is going on there vibes so we have our main girl who i don't remember anyone's name marigold yes i do marigold M marigold is our main character she's a teenager who her family is like up and moving from california to somewhere i'm thinking midwest kind of vibes and kind if of. this neighborhood has like totally clearly been gentrified and they're trying to like completely revamp all of the old housing there and it's this like city initiative to get like artists and people living there. And we also are starting to understand that Marigold has like clearly went through something that was really hard and maybe had like some sort of mental health issue that she was dealing with. She's reflecting back on and that has caused her parents to kind of not trust her. She also has a real concern with bed bugs. And now I'm worried that bugs are gonna be a big thing with this horror book and oh. We just got down to Arkansas. We took the wrong way on one of the roads. So we're just stopping to look at like the little river that's here. And then we're going to go try to go find the waterfalls. But listen, I was listening to more of White Smoke. I think I got to like chapter eight or something. I think I might DNF it for right now. I'm loving the haunted house aspect of it, but she will not stop talking about finding weed. Like everything in her life is revolving around her wanting to get a hold of weed. And I just don't care. Like nothing against weed. Whatever. You do you. But I hearing that over and over and over and over and over and over again, it feels like the main plot. And that's like, I just, it's annoying. Like I'm annoyed with her, but it's just getting in the way of my enjoyment. And I want good vibes in this vlog. So I unfortunately do not have another audiobook picked out. I could start listening to Monday's Not Coming Tomorrow, which might end up being the plan, but Scribd won't give me access to it today. And to be perfectly honest with you, I probably won't listen to a lot more today, so we'll see what the plan is for tomorrow. Until then, I'll pop in some nice b-roll of some outdoors-y things, re-establish the good vibes, and then we'll go from there. Okay, we are now at the valley where apparently the elk come and graze at dusk. So we're waiting to see. Chances are we're probably not gonna see any, but we're gonna keep an open mind. This is it. No elk yet, but we're hopeful. There were no elk. I think we were a bit early and my brother was getting annoyed. So <laughs> we pieced out of there. But luckily Scrib did end up giving me access to Monday's Not Coming and I'm already vibing with this so much more. So within the first couple of chapters, I'm excited because it seems like this is multi-timelined. We're getting like the before, the before, the before, and the after. Really what we're following, like our main character is Monday's best friend. And as she is getting home from visiting, I believe her grandma, the summer before eighth grade, she's like, where is Monday? Like they've been best friends since first grade. They always write each other during the summer and she hasn't heard anything from Monday all summer. Never got a single response to any of her letters. She gets home, she tries calling her, so her number's like given to another person. So the person who's answering the phone is like, you've got the wrong number. And she's like, what is happening? Monday ends up not showing up for school. So Claudia, our main character, 
goes over to like her mom's house. So she goes over to her mom's house. Her mom is drunk and is yelling at her for asking where she is. And she's like, Monday's not here. You need to leave. So Claudia seems to be the only one who is like concerned about the fact that Monday and her, like all of Monday's siblings are just nowhere to be found. And we're getting flashbacks to present day. And then also before Monday went missing. So back when like they were together and they were friends. And I've heard that this is just incredible. And this is like the wheelhouse I love when it comes to Tiffany D. Jackson's writing. I was liking the like haunted creepy aspects of White Smoke, but I just could tell. I ended up even trying to listen to another couple of chapters even after I told you I was DNFing it. And I could tell that it wasn't gonna be a five star. So since I have another Tiffany D. Jackson book to read, figured I would try that out. And already I'm so excited about it. It is so good. I just finished One for My Enemy and I'm realizing now I don't think I ever updated you along the way, but that's probably for the best, honestly, because I think I would have just been repeating myself over and over again anyway. I shockingly loved this book, but I don't think that it was a five star. I think it was like four, four and a half. I'm leaning toward four and a half right now. It wasn't quite as amazing as like The Atlas Paradox and Alone With You in the Ether were, but it still had everything that I love about Olive e. Blake's writing and books. You know that there's more going on, but you're never quite sure exactly what that is. And once you know, it kind of changes like how the book would have read. Like it changes what you, where you thought it was going, what you thought that you knew. And I love that, but I'm never able to like fully guess exactly what it is that's going on. And I don't really know if I could tell you any more of the plot because I think you just need to go into it not knowing a lot and just go along for the ride. My original plan with my mom, we were gonna go last week and then we pushed it back to this week, was to go to Kansas City to go to Ikea so that I can get more bookshelves because currently all of my books are just like piled in a corner on my floor. But Ikea keeps running out of the Billy bookshelves. So instead, this is the second week in a row where they still don't have them in stock. We're gonna go to the one in St. Louis tomorrow. So I'm excited because we haven't been to St. Louis together in like ever. So that'll be fun. Hopefully we'll be able to go to Ikea. I'm hoping we can hit up the half price books there. And I got us a hotel that's like right by the arch. So maybe we'll be able to see that. I may end up starting, what is it called? Drowning in the Deep? Why do I feel like that's not it? Okay, I might've told it a teensy lie because I just looked up, it's called Into the Drowning Deep. Now I have the title correct, but I didn't realize that it was over 500 pages long. And I don't know if I'm quite that committed to that cause. So instead, I didn't fully lie, only partially. I'm still gonna read a Sean McGuire book, but I think I'm going to read Over the Woodward Wall. This is technically middle grade and it's by A. Deborah Baker, but again, that is a Sean McGuire pseudonym. This is the book that's inside of the book that is middle game. So in middle game, there's like a children's book that the story is based around and we get like little excerpts from it. But then Sean McGuire went on to actually like write the, chil the series of like middle grade children's novellas. I should be able to read it. Since we're going to St. Louis, I don't wanna to commit to anything too big, lest I not be able to finish. And I just love everything that Shannon McGuire writes. So I have a feeling I'm absolutely going to love this too. Despite the fact that I've read the book that this is in, I actually don't know what this is about. We have Avery and Zib, who they're described as both exceptional children, except Avery, everything that he does is very calculated. And Zib, pretty much everything that she does is completely unpredictable. It says they live on the same street, they live in different worlds. They find themselves climbing over a stone wall into the up and under, an impossible land filled with mystery, adventure, and the strangest creatures. I'm also um, tuning into Gavin and Lexi's reading sprints. And Gavin is sprinting from this like haunted hotel that he's at. It's been a hoot. I'm so glad that I caught these live. Oh, which reminds me, I should give you a little bit of an update because I'm flying through. Monday's not coming. I should be packing and cleaning, which technically I could do because I have the audiobook for this, but I'm not. The premise for this is really interesting. And this is kind of how Grown was as well. We think from the synopsis that we know that like Monday went missing and she was found a year later, but we're like halfway through the book and we they haven't found Monday yet. Like we've been going back and forth between these different perspectives. So we know the whole time where this is heading and there's this sense of dread and we're getting little pieces up until the time that like she went missing and then when Claudia is trying to figure out why no one else is looking for her and what happened to Monday, we know that like 
they found her a year later and we are getting glimpses into what was happening when they found her or what the adults were asking Claudia or like some realizations that Claudia had come to about what led to her being missing and then being found but we don't know exactly what happened and we still don't know what happened even though like that whole plot point is in the like very the three word synopsis and I love that I love when you know where a book is going but there's so many pieces still to like be put together and I'm absolutely flying through this and the way that we're having conversations about really who people look for and who people care about and how very oftentimes black girls will go missing and not as many people are as concerned um, about that or not as many people who should be looking for them do or how children fly under the radar who would typically need help and how adults can kind of drop the ball on helping kids who would need help. We can realize once we know what has happened to someone, all of the signs that we should have put together, but how oftentimes in those moments, red flags don't look like red flags. In just Tiffany D. Jackson's writing, so she talks about like these red flags and she says, red flags, not blush red, orange red, wine or ruby red. No, bloody red flags. Did you see them, Claudia? Did you? Did you see any red flags? That's the question they ask me over and over again, hoping to find answers hoping to understand what no one could. Signs. Were there any signs Monday was in trouble? Did you see anything out of the ordinary? Anything unusual? No, nothing. In so many words, they call me a liar. That hurt more than losing my best friend. If Monday were a color, she'd be red. Crisp, striking, vivid. You couldn't miss her. A bullseye in the room, a crackling flame. I saw so much red that it blinded me to any flags. Oh my God, even just like reading that like makes me almost start to tear up. Whew. Now Katie and Gabby are sprinting. Oh, this is awesome. This is already recording. Oops. This is giving me the same vibes as the Every Heart a Doorway series that I just love so much. Sean McGuire's writing is just so whimsical. The way that they describe things and some of the things the characters will say, you're just like, see if I can find an example. Okay, this character says, three rocks should see you to the end of the forest. Maybe five. Definitely not four. Four is an even number, and those never get you anywhere. Does that make sense? No. But, like, does that make sense? Maybe. Generally, like, I like middle grade. I really do, and I can love middle grade. But generally speaking, I don't read a lot of books that follow main characters that are kids, except for Sean McGuire. The way that she writes children and the way that she talks about being a child and how children should be allowed to be innocent and free and creative and wild, but how that's often, like, our childhood is often stolen from us and that innocence is often stolen from us. I love the way that Sean McGuire has those conversations. And this is just giving me all of those same feelings that I get from Every Heart a Doorway, which is, oh my god, if you have watched my vlog on rereading that entire series in 24 hours, you already know how special that is to my heart. And I'm so glad that this is bringing up those same feelings. We just got back from St. Louis. Pay absolutely no mind to the chaos that is going on behind you. Behind me. I don't know if there's chaos going on behind you, but if you ignore mine, I'll ignore yours, okay? St. Louis was so much fun, but... So I completely forgot until we were back in the car after we were done shopping to film a single second of Ikea. Just completely forgot. I had my camera, didn't even think to use it. That's okay, it's Ikea. I didn't actually buy much other than like what I already went there for for pickup. So the two Billy bookcases, a Calic shelf, and I did get a book cart, but I think that's really it. Then we had a little bit of extra time before we had to check into the hotel. So we went to Half Price Books. This was so much fun. I've never been to a Half Price Books. My town used to have one, but they don't anymore. Like there were good options there, but I expected to like have to hold back on what I bought. And I didn't really feel that way. There wasn't like a ton there that I was like super, super stoked about. I did pick up Sadie by Courtney Summers because I know that this is Meg with Books like favorite author. I actually think she just filmed a video where Courtney Summers is picking out books for Meg to read. Super cool. And I picked up a copy of How to Be an Anti-Racist. I actually think I already own a copy of this book, but I wanted another copy because I don't know where that one is. 
But then after that, after we went by the hotel, which was actually so cool, I was hoping that we would get a room with a view of the arch, but I didn't pay extra for that, but I'm a Hyatt member. So I thought maybe if they had like an extra one, it would maybe give it. And we did get like a part, like a good partial view of it. So we got to see the arch from our room. It was super nice. The iconic part of the night, the best part was dinner hands down. I love Italian food, but I was a little bit nervous because I knew that St. Louis has incredible Italian food. I wasn't nervous about that. I was nervous because I know that like my mom likes Italian food, but it's not like her favorite. And I wanted something that both of us would really love. So we picked a restaurant on the hill, which is this Italian neighborhood in St. Louis that just has the most incredible Italian food. But I hadn't been there since I was like a kid. This is the first time I think me and my mom have made a trip to St. Louis. Oh my God. We went to Zia's on the hill. Both of us were like blown away. Like we could not remember the last time we had a meal that was that good. And we like to eat out. Like we love trying new places and like eating good food. I'm not like a foodie by any means, okay? But this was so good. The service was incredible and we could not, we couldn't stop eating. I wish that I lived closer, but at the same time, I'm also glad that I don't live closer because I would spend all my money. But honestly, for the two of us, it was $50 and then plus tip. Uh, what? <laughs> and we got, both got an entree and we got dessert and it was so much food. Like if you lived closer, you could definitely like take some home. I cannot express, like I don't get this excited about telling people about new places that I've eaten very often. It was so good. If you are ever there, Zia's on the hill, 12 out of 10. And the only reason, like all of the restaurants around there look so good that it's just kind of like your pick. The only reason that I picked that one was because that they did reservations online. And I just wanted to make sure that we had a table in case we were starving after Ikea. So that's the only reason we picked that one specifically. I'm sure all of the other restaurants are incredible too. I'm so glad that we picked that one because both of us were just so excited, but on our way there, I was also really excited because I ran into a free library. And I don't, like, I know that there are free libraries around my city, but I don't know where any of them are. I've never, like, accidentally ran into one. And we just so happened to park literally right in front of one. So I was like, oh my god, I have to give a book. But I didn't bring extra books with it. I didn't bring any books. I only brought my Kindle. So I gave my Sadie book that I got at the uh, Half Price Books to the free library because I couldn't leave without giving a book. And that's okay. I'm just so glad that I got to give a book to the free library. And now I need to find some free libraries. My mom owns a pottery shop and we were talking about how we should set up a free library in front of there because it's right next to like a park where people walk by all of the time. They're building apartments next to there now. It would be a fantastic place for one. And then that would be a good place for me to be able to donate some of the books that I unhaul. It was so much fun. What a good trip. Like, it was just perfect. And I was honestly nervous because we don't tend to go to St. Louis a lot. Like we usually, like I said, we usually go to Kansas City. And that's just because like, that's what, in my mind, Kansas City is so much closer to us, but it's really not. I didn't get any reading done on that trip. I didn't actually bring any of the books that I'm reading with me. I brought my Kindle, which I wasn't reading a book on my Kindle, but that's okay. Because really there wasn't like a lot of time for reading anyway, and it all worked out. I, in theory, would love to listen to the rest of Monday's Not Coming while I put together my bookshelves but I'm a little bit nervous because sometimes I get in my head while I'm building things and then I don't realize that I've missed what's happening on the audiobook and this is one that like I don't want to miss anything. Otherwise I'll probably just watch Kayla. Well re-watch Kayla because I've watched all of her videos many times. I just finished Over the Woodward Wall. I didn't update you again because it's like super short and I don't feel like there's much more I could talk about with the plot. The only thing I will say is that I didn't know going into this that this is like a travel quest story and generally speaking I don't like those. It had I known that I probably wouldn't have chosen it for a five star prediction because I wouldn't have predicted that it would be five stars just because very rarely if ever have I given a story where people have like been traveling afoot from one place to the other five stars I just don't like it I feel like it's really like cyclical and I can like I don't like how that plot plays out but here's the thing is that Sean McGuire I just love how they write characters and just how they write in general. There are so many places in here that I'm just blown away by the writing and I love our like, one of our main characters Zib and Avery. Zib is the girl. I love her so much and I feel the very like I feel the same way in a lot of Sean McGuire's books that she writes female characters so well. So I very much in loving Zib's vibes. I like the characters and the writing in here, but the plot itself is never gonna be a five star. That being said, I still think I'm landing on like a th hmm. three and a half. It's either a high three and a half or a lower four, but either way, I'll probably just round it up on Goodreads to a four. This is, if you need like a comparison, like a mixture of if middle game met every heart of doorway, but middle grade. 
I don't think that I would recommend this like as your first Sean McGuire book. If you're wanting to try out Sean McGuire's writing and see if it works for you, I would recommend the Every Heart, like the Wayward Children Every Heart of Doorway series because I just think, oh, that, I just love that series so much. Like if you've seen, sorry, Oliver's tail keeps just whipping around everywhere. If you've seen that vlog that I did on it, you already know it just has such a place, a special place in my heart. But I think objectively people like that more, like it has a higher average rating. And I just think objectively it's going to appeal to more people. Whereas this is going to be something to read if you loved Every Heart of Doorway and Middle Game and you wanted to read the story that is going along inside of Middle Game. But either way, I'm not disappointed because as soon as I figured out that like that's where the plot was going was this quest traveling kind of story, I already kind of bumped down my expectations of this being a five star because I knew that that if anyone was going to make it work for me, it would be Sean McGuire. But I knew that it probably wasn't going to be a five star. Oliver is watching Gavin's new vlog with me. Where's Gavin? Oh, he's just showing around the haunted house. Okay. Oliver, you're going to knock a plant over like you always do. There's not enough room for you there. Oh, what is your plan? Honestly, I thought there for a bit that I was going to rate this like three stars, three and a half. But that ending bumped it up to a four. Oh my god. I didn't see that coming at all. I think that this kind of reminds me of other Tiffany D. Jackson books in the like way that it's written. Not in the concept at all, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing at all. I can just feel her writing in this. So I should have seen coming that like there would be, and I talked about that, right? That like we knew the ending, but clearly we didn't know the ending. But this just wasn't on my radar at all. And has so many amazing conversations that Tiffany D. Jackson books always have. I'm really, really glad that I stopped reading White Smoke and picked this one up instead because I think that this was definitely the winner. It still isn't a five star. I'm realizing now we didn't get any five stars out of my five star predictions, but then oddly enough, I'm also not disappointed in any of that. Like I'm happy with the four, four and a halfs, three and a halfs that we got, which is good because I was a little bit worried that with a video like this, if you're predicting that something's gonna be a five star, you've already built it up in your head and therefore it has higher expectations and might not be able to live up to those expectations. So even if it's still a really good book, sometimes it can still feel disappointing. I don't feel disappointed in any of these. I do hate that my five star streak that I really had going there toward the first month, first part of the month is, but all of these were winners. In the theme of the red covers that we had going on, I realized that this TBR was very aesthetic. Leave me a red heart in the comments below if you made it all the way to the end of the video. And if you enjoyed this, consider subscribing, hitting that thumbs up button, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye!